This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. The Norris Group proudly presents our 15th annual award-winning event, I Survived Real Estate. Industry experts join Bruce Norris to discuss evolving industry trends, real estate bubbles, inflation, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. See iSurvivedRealEstate.com for event details, information on all our generous sponsors, and to connect with our speakers. We want to thank our platinum partners. San Diego Creative Investors Association, U Direct IRA Services, White Feather Investments, The Collective Genius, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. I thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today we have a special guest, John Schaub. John Schaub is a recent Roni Award winner, and we don't give those away lightly. Uh, John has prospered during three recessions, four tax law changes, and interest rates ranging from, he says, 6 to 16% is 2, two to 16. And now we're all the way back up there. And uh, in his 35 years as a real estate investor, his 2016 best selling book, Building Wealth One House at a Time, second edition, assisted more than 100,000 real estate enthusiasts on the way to successful investing. John recommends buying better, well-located rather than cheaper houses and, and other management intensive properties. Better houses are more profitable, far less trouble. He advocates by paying off debt, owning properties free and clear and renting only to long-term high quality tenants. John buys, sells and manages his own properties and enjoys providing high quality housing at fair prices for working families in his community. He teaches one seminar each year where students learn how to identify the best investment properties in their town, how to buy it below market price, and how to negotiate terms that guarantee a profit. John's a Florida native, is a proud graduate of the University of Florida, where he earned his BA from the College of Business Administration in 1970. He is an accomplished boat captain, power and sail, fisherman, skier, snow and water, and an instrument rated pilot. Uh, John loves to travel, especially with his wife, Valerie, and their young adult children. John, welcome back to our show. Thanks, Bruce. Glad to be here. You know, it's interesting. I asked Mike Cantu one time at a lunch, and uh, I said, what, what word is captured in your mind by certain real estate trainers? And I, I did that this morning when I thought of you. And I, I really think lifestyle is what comes to mind. And that's a, that's a really high compliment because I think you have figured out a process to where you ended up getting what you wanted and then you actually realized you had it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think uh, leading a balanced life is, is a challenge uh, in any, if you're running your own business, which I've done now for more than 40 years, but it, it's the ultimate challenge. You know, you, you don't want to just run your business and then miss out on the rest of life. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, I've had some pretty good role models uh, it, it, on both sides. You know, I've had some partners who are just business, 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 never did anything for fun. Then I had other partners who did a lot of things for fun, you know, and I've had some students. Uh, uh, I've got a good buddy who took off for a whole year, moved his family to Greece for a year and uh, he's a young guy he's in his 40s so you know it's uh you see people do things like that and you say i could do that you know we uh just recently flew our plane up to alaska and back and that was a lot of fun a real real, real adventure uh but you, you start thinking about things you want to do that are fun and uh you want to you want to have uh that part of the life in balance with your business part yeah i i wrote in the in the comments i was writing this morning it, it seems like you have mastered enough is enough and very few people do that. Well, yeah, and and you can get to enough is enough pretty fast if you'll if you'll focus on it, you know. But I guess you have to have a handle on it because everybody has a different number, everybody has a different lifestyle. And but once you figure out what you want to do, um, you know, you, you should you 
don't want to spend all of your life just making money. You want to spend some of your life enjoying that money. I, I don't know, but I, I find the other more common that the goalpost gets moved constantly. <clears throat> and um, I, you know, I had a very interesting phone call of, and s- sort of with some urgency of where to place money. This is coming from a gentleman that has a net worth in excess of a hundred million dollars in his 90. Yeah. And I'm just, wow. <laughs> Couldn't it be Should have spent some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, but you know, it's just a different, if it's, maybe that's how he got where he, where he is. But then I, I'm thinking I'm interviewing you and I, uh, that comment that I made, you know, when I heard your voice, I said, I picture you on a boat. It was, was really a true statement. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> um, So how did you get started in real estate? We'll go through just a little bit of your, of your history, how you landed on the investing square. Okay. Well, I uh, took courses in college. When I got out of college, I, you know, had the first job I had was selling real estate. I I got my real estate license while I was in college. Uh, I sold a little apartment building was my my first sale and made, made about $5,000 commission. This is back in the early seventies. And uh, decided that, you know, that was pretty easy money. <laughs> it, it wasn't a lot of work to, to sell a farmer building. So we started selling. I, I organized a, a brokerage office. I had uh, 13 salesmen at one time, um, but found I didn't like that side of the business because, if, you know, if you've ever had a bunch of people work for you, and I know you have, there's a lot of babysitting that goes on. You know, it takes a lot of your time just managing people. Uh, and, and I could see my lifestyle going the wrong way. I didn't want to do that. So I started buying properties back in the early 70s, and I still own the first property I ever bought. I probably will keep it forever. Uh, but I found that buying different kinds of properties had different challenges. I had a motel, I had apartment buildings, I had duplexes, I had a restaurant, and uh, a wine and cheese shop. So uh, <laughs> all, all those things are different, you know. And, yeah. and some of them made money, some of them didn't. But then I started fine-tuning this operation. So I say, how, how can I make the most money with, without working all the time, you know, without working 24 seven. And I have a good friend who's a banker and I said, I want to work just like he does, you know, go to work at nine in the morning, come home at four and never work weekends. That's my job. So I started designing my, my investing around that idea, you know, by by buying properties that would attract long-term tenants who would stay and and sort of self-manage, you know, nobody self-manages a hundred percent of the time, but, you know, we just had this storm down here. You and I were talking about it and and uh, I bet you at least a half a dozen, maybe closer to a dozen of my tenants called me and said, don't worry about the thing. We've got it all fixed up. We cleaned up the yard. We fixed everything that was broken. You know, they, they do take care of their own properties. And it's uh, you wouldn't get that in the apartment business and certainly wouldn't have it in the commercial business. Those people would want you to come out and fix stuff right now. So it's uh, been an interesting transition, but I'm really happy where I am today, which is, you know, a, a relatively small portfolio of single family houses that provide me plenty of money to, to live well and, and uh, you know, keep up with inflation. And they're not, they don't take much of my time to manage, you know, literally I'd work a couple hours a week if that's all I did, manage those properties. <laughs> well, that's a good work week right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always, in, I, and you and I have talked before, so I, I knew some of this history, but uh, I'm always interested in the process of how you got to investing. So you started, not everybody, not very many investors actually start as an agent. So making that transition, um, I think when, when, it's hard to get off of the first model you're shown. At least it was for me. So I didn't do buy, buy and hold, and I did, wasn't a real estate in, uh, agent. I just got shown the flipping business one night and literally got a job the next day and did that. And I thought that's what you did. Um, obviously, uh, Jack Fullerton was on my case all the time. Um, why don't you hold something? But it wasn't the model I was shown. It took me a while before I understood why that was really smart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But once you're, once you kind of get stuck on a model, it's you think, oh, this is it. And part of the challenge getting away from flipping and holding was the immediate profit motive. So, okay, I'm going to get $300 a month or I can get 30 grand. Right. You just, you kind of fall for the, I'll take the 30 grand, but then eventually you realize if I had kept like a bunch of those, I would have 30 grand every month on auto autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a lot better. 
a delayed gratification is, is, uh, <laughs> uh you've got to get your head around that, but it, but it's hard, especially when you're young, you know, you're, you're, you're you and I were both young when we started and, and, uh, you know, you, you want to hit it, you want to do it now. You don't want to wait 20 years uh, to start spending money. But what I found was you didn't have to wait 20 years. You know, I, I went skiing for the first time in 1973, snow skiing. And mm-hmm. I'm a Florida boy, so we don't have any, any snow in Florida, but my buddy talked me into coming on a trip and I loved it. So I committed to ski every year and I have every year since then, even if I didn't have any money, I was going skiing. And it's funny, you know, you, you can, you can make that kind of thing happen. If you have uh, uh, goals that, that uh, you want to accomplish, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of money. You know, we didn't, we didn't stay in the Ritz. We, we stayed in the holiday Inn, <laughs> but uh, we went skiing and had fun. That's cool. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things happens in, when you're in the flip business, you're more likely to get a wholesale deal match with a lot, not, not such a great location. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I think that is part of why it never attracted me to say, well, I'll just keep this a rental because I'm looking around going, I don't think 20% of the world would want to rent here. Right. Right. And so you just sell it. So it never, it just, I didn't make the transition until, till later, which I'm glad I did. Obviously it just made my life really boring yeah. and that's great. <laughs> Well, you know, one, the breakthrough I had here back in the early seventies, I rode around with a good friend of mine who was sort of my mentor and, and he showed me a number of properties that he used to own. And I asked him, why didn't you keep them? <laughs> you <know? laughs> these, are, these are good properties. You know, they're on the beach. They're nice properties. And he said, well, I could sell them and make a profit. And, and that worked on me. You know, I started thinking about that because, uh, you know, if, if you sell the good properties, especially, uh, and if you, you end up with ones that aren't so good, so you want to hold your best properties forever. That's been my strategy. You know, if I buy something that's really good in a good neighborhood that attracts great tenants, I just won't sell it. You, you know, and people try to buy them from me. I had a guy in here uh, this week that, uh, uh, he wanted to buy a house from me and I gave him a, a, what I thought was a very high number. And he thought, said, I'll think about it. Well, I hope he doesn't come back. I don't want to sell that house. (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, and you know, we, we sold a couple of houses last year. It's kind of funny. Uh, Chuck Considine, uh, I don't know if you ever knew him, but he, he had a class he taught that I took three times on, on, uh, business, uh, structure and and avoiding taxes and and real estate investing and uh, tax law. He was a a CPA and a, and a tax attorney. He always said equity is a part of the property that makes you feel good until you sell it. Uh, (laughs) And it's amazing how fast that money disappears after you sell it, (laughs) you know, that is, yeah. But but while you still have the property, you've got a lot more equity. You know, you you can say, I've got a million dollars. That house is worth a million dollars, but you sell it, that million dollars disappears pretty fast. Uh, Did you have a favorite mentor not connected to real estate? For me, I had, I had a Jim Rohn Now Jim Rohn had nothing to do with real estate, but he definitely right, right. impacted my business life for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you have, do you have anybody in that category? I'm, I'm thinking, uh, okay. and, I, and I listened to all Jim's Jim Rohn's uh, tapes. I, I, I thought he was genius. You know, he really was a great teacher and I did learn a lot from him. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I'd have to read back to my grandmother. She taught me a lot, <laughs> but you know, no, you, hey. you watch what people do and how they live their lives and, and who's happy and who's not happy. And uh, you, you try to find somebody who, uh, you know, maybe has a, the same basic skill set that you have, who's really happy and, and study what they're doing and, and how they do it. Uh, but, but most of everybody I've hung around has had some connection to real estate. <laughs> you know, I've been, right. I've been in Florida all my life. We, we talk real estate night and day down here. Uh so, so I, I uh, other than uh, some family members, I, I really can't come up with somebody who, who had a lot of impact other than the real estate guys. And, and they have different impact. You know, some of them were doing things I didn't want to do. And I learned that I did not want to do it by watching how they, they had to live. And other, other people were, you know, very passive and they were just kind of collecting coupons. I said, that's the side I want to be on. You know, I want to be on a passive side, not the, the side where you, you have 10 phone calls every morning that you have to, the, the answer and go to work. The title of one of the, one of your books, building wealth, one house at a time. Uh, it's interesting. Cause I, you know, I always thought about quantity and what that title tells me, it seems like you could, you could accomplish that part-time. Absolutely. And then most of my students, you know, have some kind of uh, employment other, other than just real estate. Not, not many people are full-time real estate. So they are working, you know, some of my favorite folks, they, husband and wife team work for Delta Airlines. 
they bought one house and they bought one more house and they finally see that the, the, you, know, you, you teach yourself how to do these things. Uh, you know, you read the book, but then you have to go out and do it, to, to build a self-confidence to know that you can do it over and over and over again. And you start seeing the reward to see the cash flow that comes from these properties. And so they were both able to quit their jobs after a few years, you know, not, not one or two, but probably a half a dozen years and uh, go full time into investing because they, they had developed the skill set to do that. So there's a, there's a training period here. Uh, you know, you, you had the skill set because you were, you were flipping property. So you knew a lot about negotiation and, and you understood real estate. So transitioning into investing was a fairly simple thing. Uh, but somebody who knows nothing about investing and they, you know, they're a dentist or, you know, have some other job that they have to, you know, even though they're a genius at what they do, they have to understand they don't know much about real estate and they have to go. And that's why the building wealth one house at a time makes sense for these people because mm -hmm. some, you know, some people go out and buy 20 houses and that could be a disaster. <laughs> you know, if you don't know how to manage or you pay too much or you buy the wrong kind of market, you can go broke pretty fast, but buying one at a time, it's not going to put you out of business. So you can start anytime during the market. You can start right now, or you can start during the great depression or right at the top of the market. And you won't get hurt if you just buy one at a time. That makes sense. Now, what's a little unusual is you favor off favor paying off houses. And I, I don't think that's common advice. And so why did you land on that square? I like cash flow. You know, nothing has cash flow like a free and clear house. <laughs> so you go the other, you go one way or the other. And I have good friends who, who uh, uh, most of them don't have a big family, but they, you know, they, they refinance their houses every chance they get because they can pull that money out tax free. And that their plan is to die with, uh, you know, 110% loans on every one of those houses. <laughs> but uh, it's just a different way of looking at things. My life is simple. You know, if you have a, a bunch of loans, you, you have something you have to do. You have to keep track of the loans. You have to keep those houses insured. I mean, you know, life is much more complicated and you have more obligations with a, uh, a highly leveraged portfolio. And, and, uh, and I don't think you sleep as well. I, you know, not, nothing makes me sleep better than a free and clear house. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, I know that house will always be there, you know, unless I, unless I do something incredibly stupid, um, that house is bulletproof. You know? So, you know, well, just so you know, you guys really had an influence on me in that um, because I was surrounded with people with definitely the leverage mentality. Mm -hmm. And we had um, we had a successful year in 2005. And um, my wife and I had, had talked about, you know, okay, well, we were going to do some 1031 exchanging and all that. And she, she said this sentence to me, couldn't we just pay everything off and relax? And I, it was so counter what my head was, but I really gave that some thought. And from that day forward, I haven't owed anything. And it has been just like what you said, you go to sleep at night and you just, okay, there's a part of your life that you don't really have to worry about. Mm -hmm. And that felt good. <laughs> it really did. And I think most people can relate to that. You know, most people can, you can, first of all, you can do the math. You can say, if I own five free and clear houses and maybe $2,000 a month each, I'd have $10,000 a month. Would that be enough? And, and you start, you, you start putting together a plan to get where you want to be as far as number of houses, free and clear houses. And, and the nice thing about the house business is even though the numbers are going to change dramatically over the next 30 years, like they have over the last 30 years, the houses keep up with those numbers changing. You know, they, they're, they're, they're an inflation hedge. So, uh, is, is, uh, if chicken goes from $3 a pound to $7 a pound, houses will go up too. <laughs> you'll still be able to afford chicken. Well, that's, what's interesting. Not only rent houses, but you know, when one of the things that I had the privilege when I, uh, was doing a lot of the reports is I had access to, um, Cal Poly Pomona had done a report for contractors for since the sixties. And, um, there was, there's a vault literally where they have the early, uh, copies of one a month. Like, so if you go into the vault, you have one copy of May, 1974, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I was the only person ever let into the vault other than the guy that owned the whole thing. Wow. And, uh, I went through some of those reports, uh, during the seventies and it was the coolest thing. They, they had broken down the cost of the same house for the, for a decade of the seventies. Mm -hmm. So they quoted from the builder perspective, what was the plumber cost? What was the electrician? What was the labor unit? Right. And I have, have all these charts and I really realized, wow, 
when I own a house, I own a basket of commodities. I own a basket of labor. So when all that goes up as for new houses, my walls go up uh, in value. And there was a chart that I produced. This is true in California. It's happened four times where used inventory sells for more than new per square foot. Sure. And because of the demand. So it is really a hedge uh, on inflation because mm -hmm. of the, it's the commodity base. So that was exciting for me to put a practical uh, finishing touch on that and go, okay, well, that's why I want to hold this stuff. Yeah. And I don't have to recreate the wheel. And I think that's the other thing. It's very efficient. Once you have that in place, okay, well, you have some choices. You don't have to go, okay, well, gosh, I got to go flip another five houses to pay for whatever. So good strategy. <laughs> good. Thank you. Glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> We'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Chase Leland Photography, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Keystone CPA Inc., LA South RIA, Lavis Tax Wealth Management, NorCal RIA, NSDREI, Pasadena Phoebe, Tony Alvarez, White House Catering, Wilson Investments, Windermere Tower Realty. See iSurvivedRealEstate.com for event details, information on all our generous supporters, and to connect with our speakers. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.